Hello, and welcome to Runkle of the Bailey. My name is Ian Runkle. I'm a Canadian criminal defense and firearms lawyer. And today I want to talk a bit about the ban on shuriken or throwing stars. So these are items that are prohibited in Canada, so they count as prohibited weapons. And let's bring up the regulations here. So this is former prohibited weapons order number two. Uh, it says former, but that just means that's the time that they brought this in. This was done via order in council, but this is still in effect. So it bans several things. One of them is any instrument or device commonly known as shuriken, being a hard, non-flexible plate having three or more radiating points with one or more sharp edges in the shape of a polygon, trefoil, cross, star, diamond, or other geometrical shape, and any similar instrument or device. So as far as I know, there's only one case that has actually looked at what this means. And that's the case of the Queen and Campbell. I think you're going to enjoy this. I certainly enjoy this case because the judge has some fairly sharp commentary on how these laws come into place and how they should be interpreted. So let's go and have a look at that. The case starts off with a fairly detailed description of a couple of items which were found and later made exhibits at trial. I'm not going to read them, but let's take a brief moment to do some arts and crafts. And so what we see is exhibit one is something that looks vaguely like this. This is sort of my best uh, ability to replicate it. It's a central bit of duct tape with four nails, four substantial nails. And the court notes, as per the original, that it's bendy. So it flexes a little bit. But they also note that its uh, physical characteristics are such that if held in a hand and used in a pounding motion, or if thrown from the hand like a baseball, it could easily cause substantial physical injury to a human, especially if it struck exposed skin with one of its nail tips aligned squarely forward. I wouldn't want to have this thrown at me. Exhibit two is something similar, but it has smaller nails, it has more of them, and so it's this is my best effort at duplicating it. Again, Maybe not the most effective weapon out there, but I certainly wouldn't want somebody throwing this at me. Now, the accused in this, Mr. Campbell, was charged with possession of shuriken with respect to these items. Now, I may have already given away the ending, but let's go through what the court has to say about this, and we can see how or whether these are shuriken, and if so, how the court gets to that determination. I've skipped over a fair bit of historical discussion because ultimately the judge looks at the history of this law and finds that it's not terribly useful for interpretation. So as much as I would love to spend 20 minutes with you going over that and telling you that it doesn't mean anything, let's get on to the more interesting parts. So the ruling. So this court concludes this uh, ban merits a narrow interpretation to ensure it retains reasonableness and to minimize its ability to bring punishment down upon the innocent. As a matter of law, I rule has next stated, an object is not a prohibited weapon within the meaning of this section unless it meets all of the following criteria. So it's not a prohibited shuriken unless it meets all of these elements. And this is a very clear, well-articulated decision so this is why I think that this decision is likely to be followed by other courts. So the first is it must be a weapon as defined in the code's definition of a weapon. So in order for something to be a prohibited weapon, it must first be a weapon. There is an exception to that. Uh, knives that open automatically or by gravity or the like are actually outside of that definition. So be aware of that. Next, it must be shuriken within the historical 
pre, and then this is the legislation, meaning of the word shuriken. So it had to be shuriken within the definition as it existed at the time the ban was imposed. It must be widely known by the general population of Canadians, not just by groups such as peace officers and martial arts fans, to be shuriken or a shuriken. Now, this, I think, would be a fun issue at trial because now you have to prove what the general population of Canadians thinks about this item. That might be a little tough for a lot of, uh, a lot of different things. For its physical characteristics must match those listed in the second portion. So it basically said that it has to have those elements. It's not a shuriken just because it's known as a shuriken. It must also be rigid enough overall that it will not flex to a degree discernible by the naked eye or hand when hand pressure of an adult human is applied to it. So it can't be too bendy. Can't, can't do this. And the next point, and I love the language here. It's just wonderful uh, judicial language. Its radiating points must have uh, edges sharp enough to cut easily through human skin and flesh the way a butcher knife normally will, and a butter knife will not. Wonderful language there. Very poetic. Uh, also makes fairly clear what he's talking about. Also notes, it must be neither so large and heavy nor so small and light that it lacks practical usefulness as a weapon within the ordinary lay meaning of the word weapon. You know, if we think of a shuriken sculpture that's 20 feet across, that shouldn't be banned based on this. You know, you couldn't really throw that at somebody. And similarly, if it was yay big, it's also not going to be a useful weapon. And the last point it must not be an object of type generally used for innocuous purposes, such as circular saw blades used in carpentry, rowels used in riding spurs, or shards of glass used in ornamental glass works. So even if the general public thinks of that as a shuriken, so long as it's got a general useful purpose and it's not intended or built as that, he's saying it's excluded from that definition. If any part of this ruling is to be attacked, I think that part might be the most attackable, but only really on the basis that it's already covered by the other sections in the sense that it's doubtful that a circular saw blade is going to be known by the general public as shuriken. Similarly, shards of glass, that kind of thing. So he goes on and is now talking a little bit about that dichotomy of the uh, philosophy of this. As one anticipates those opposed to the private ownership of weapons will say the ruling will make it more difficult to obtain convictions under paragraph 2b and thereby will undermine the legislation's public safety purpose. Even if the ruling complicates prosecutions, the safety of Canadians will be little affected. Whether interpreted broadly and liberally or interpreted narrowly, paragraph 2b's ability to protect the citizenry from physical harm is more illusionary than real. So here's where we get to some real snark because the judge is basically commenting that this law is pointless. There is not a rash of shuriken related murders. I'm not aware of any shuriken related murder that has ever happened in Canada. If somebody knows of one, please let me know because I wouldn't want to be going around saying that it's never happened if it has, but I'd be surprised. Judge continues, first, shuriken have are a rather low factor of inherent dangerousness, so in eliminating them from society would do little to improve public safety. Being inanimate, they lack volition. As gun owners, you've probably heard this, you know, gun doesn't, the gun doesn't pull its own trigger. You know, I put the gun on the, on a chair, it doesn't go off and kill somebody. So this is an argument that gun owners are familiar with. They therefore lack the ability to deliberately attack humans. Those deficiencies make them far less inherently dangerous to humans than are many lawfully possessed animals. Surely common sense would indicate that shuriken are far less inherently dangerous than enraged Rottweilers, Dobermans, and Bull Mastiffs. The chemistry of some inanimate objects makes them inherently dangerous to humans. Substances such as gasoline sometimes behave as if they had a will of their own. Their chemistry makes them prone to spontaneous explosion of fire or allows them to evapor evaporate spontaneously to form a toxic and slash or flammable vapor. 
nothing suggests that shuriken possess such inherently dangerous traits. Some inanimate things are inherently dangerous to humans because of their mass, mechanical complexity, and ability to attain high speed once in motion. At high speeds, their large mass provides them great momentum. Their momentum enables them to continue moving unassisted for a period of time, as if animate, and provides them force sufficient to kill several humans simultaneously and easily. Modern motor vehicles typify inherently dangerous objects of this type. So, and if we look, you know, in terms of the number of people killed by cars in a year, it's absolutely way higher than shuriken-related deaths. In contrast, shuriken possess little inherent dangerousness of this nature. Unlike the things just discussed, things that Canadians commonly and legally possess, they cannot consciously attack humans, burn them, blow them up, poison them, or crush them. At their most dangerous state, they, with substantial human assistance, have some ability to kill humans through motion, causing them to impact upon a human in slashing or stab-like fashion. Viewed dispassionately, shuriken do not appear markedly more dangerous than numerous small, rigid objects with sharp points or edges, commonly and lawfully possessed by Canadians as innocuous tools for work or recreation. And he's right there. I mean, you got to think, if you were faced with a choice between somebody coming after you with something like this versus somebody coming after you with a kitchen knife, you'd probably rather face the guy with this thing than the guy with the kitchen knife. This thing, I mean, it might hurt, but it's it's not what I'd reach for if I was feeling like I was in danger. So, the fact Canadians can lawfully possess large ferocious dogs, volatile and poisonous liquids like gasoline, and high-speed sports cars with little restriction but cannot lawfully possess shuriken, taxes, or shuriken at all, taxes credulity when the inherent, relative inherent dangerousness of the items is compared. Perhaps the fact signifies weapons phobia operates as a greater political force in Canada than one might expect. I love it. I just, I love the language in this one. Second, the order, uh, however interpreted, cannot in fact prevent the easy availability of the objects it outlaws. Their removal from the normal retail marketplace is rather futile because, unlike computers and television sets, they are mechanically very simple and easily manufactured by anyone determined to acquire them despite the legislation. I myself am not super handy. I am not... I do a little bit, I dabble, but I'm not, you know, I'm not a machinist, I'm not a swordsmith, I'm not any of those things. But I could probably knock out some functional shuriken, and I don't mean like these things, which the, uh, but I mean, you know, actual things out of metal with an edge that is sharp enough to do the job, even if not perfect, in an afternoon. You know, it wouldn't be too hard. So third, even if shuriken could be kept out of the hands of Canadians, little would be accomplished to improve public safety for the objects could be substituted by other legally available items with a similar or superior level of inherent dangerousness. Those determined to harm others could and no doubt would simply use knives, hatchets, machetes, and a host of other sharp edged rigid tools of too much social utility to outlaw. And he also notes here that it doesn't, it prohibits the possession of objects, not the harming of others. But uh, goes on to say, it's not, a narrow interpretation won't undermine its apparent public safety purpose because, one, the objects it prohibits do not constitute much danger to the public. Two, it's impossible to eliminate their availability. Three, other legal objects can be used in substitution. For the code itself, so the restrictions saying you can't hurt people, you can't attack people with weapons, etc., can provide. And five, its ability to deter violent acts is minimal. Stated in lay terminology, the bad won't obey it and the good don't need it. <laughs> Again, I love the language here. If interpreted broadly and liberally, paragraph 2b's ability to punish the innocent is apt to exceed its ability to deter the guilty. So you... I mean, if we take it to its extreme and it could have banned saw blades, you know, that would have endangered a lot of carpenters, but not a lot of criminals. I love the this paragraph as well. Even if a narrow interpretation reduces its ability to protect the public from physical harm, legislators and the judiciary should guard against overestimating the importance Canadians 
place upon physical well-being in their portfolio of values. Although a significant number of Canadians may be phobic about weapons, physical well-being isn't the only condition of existence they value. They also value privacy, freedom from state interference, including freedom from unreasonable search, and the opportunity to own and use property unfettered by socially useless or socially counterproductive bureaucratic red tape. Moreover, security from physical harm probably isn't uppermost among those things or conditions of existence Canadians treasure. If it was smoking tobacco, drinking liquor, practicing promiscuous sex, working in high-paying, high-risk occupations, engaging in world travel, and enjoying risky recreational activity would not be as popular with Canadians as these activities are. So he then goes on to say that neither Exhibit 1 nor Exhibit 2 meets the criteria because they neither possess the rigidity, so again, nor the sharpness of edge required by the fourth definition. And so he indicates for present purposes, it's unnecessary to determine whether the evidence proves they meet all remaining criteria, and I decline to do so. And once they're uh, not prohibited weapons, it doesn't really matter who possesses them. That was, it looks like that was going to be another issue at trial, but doesn't get dealt with here. So the accused is found not guilty. And similarly, I shouldn't be going to jail for having made these rather useless objects. Just uh, before I close out here, I'll just note as well that, uh, I like the last paragraph here, some might view this judgment as endorsing the widespread possession or private possession of shuriken and similar objects. It doesn't. It simply recognizes and accepts that reasonableness, objectivity, and common sense are things of fundamental legal importance to legislation. So as you can see, the judge had some fairly sharp comments about the legislators who decided to ban shuriken. I'll just note, just as an aside, uh, right now, if I wanted, there are several different places I could go to throw axes at a target. But of course, there's no places I could go to throw shuriken at a target. There's several places I could go where I could shoot arrows at a target or bullets at a target. It seems that we've foreclosed through this legislation what could have been a fairly innocuous sporting activity. So that's part of why you get the commentary here. But I, this is one of my favorite decisions. It's, you know, it covers an issue that just doesn't come up that often, but I love the language in it. I love the, the reasoning in it. It's very crystal clear, and it's a judge who spots essentially that this legislation, as it might have been interpreted, is like the Titanic chugging full speed towards an iceberg. And, you know, he grabs the uh, the wheel and steers it away before we get into a position of people having to maybe get charged for having saw blades and similar things. So I appreciate this decision. I hope you enjoyed hearing about it. Uh, if you did find this all to be educational or interesting, please like, share, and subscribe. I also have a link below to my Patreon if you want to contribute. Thank you and look forward to the next video.